Hello again, and welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk general aviation with relevant news and flying tips for pilots and student pilots to help keep you safe. I'm Max Truscott. Today, we'll be talking about an emergency that occurred earlier in the month as Endeavor Flight 1516 departed LaGuardia en route to Savannah, Georgia. Now, the controllers and the flight crew work together remarkably well, and there's a lot that GA pilots can learn from their interactions. We'll also replay an interview from the Plain Crazy Down Under podcast in which they interviewed Mark Robinson of Frequentis about remote towers. And speaking of remote towers, last week in episode 292, we talked with Rob Mark about this new technology that's similar to air traffic control towers, and we talked about why remote towers have been so slow to be certified in the U.S. And we also talked about the fatal crash of a Cirrus SR-20 that involved a student pilot who crashed at night in New Jersey, so if you didn't hear that episode, you may want to check it out at aviationnewstalk.com slash 292. And so that you don't miss next week's episode, go to whatever app that you're using to listen to me now and take a moment right now and touch the subscribe key or if you're using the Apple Podcast app, the follow key, so that next week's episode is downloaded for free. And this is a listener-supported show. So if you've been listening for a while and you're finding value in the show, maybe it's even helped you become a safer pilot or pass a check ride. Please make a donation now to help support the show. To do that, go to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. To sign up to make a monthly donation or to make a one-time donation, go to aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. Those links are in the show notes, and when you do sign up, I'll mention your name on the show. Coming up in the news for the week of September 18th, 2023, NetJet signs a record-breaking order for new jets. Cirrus has a Rotax power trainer under development. And posting on social media is blamed for a fatal crash. All this and more, and the news starts now. From TextronAviation.com, Textron Aviation and NetJets announce a record-breaking fleet agreement with options for NetJets to purchase up to 1,500 additional Cessna Citation business jets over the next 15 years. According to analysts at Jefferies, this deal could be valued at approximately $30 billion. Now, just to put that in perspective, that would be a large deal for airliners. And I'm guessing it's probably the largest deal in history for general aviation aircraft. The agreement extends NetJet's existing fleet agreement and includes options for an increasing number of aircraft each year, enabling NetJets to expand its fleet with Cessna Citation Ascend, Citation Latitude, and Citation Longitude aircraft. And NetJets has been named the fleet launch customer for Textron's newest jet, the Citation Ascend. Deliveries of the Ascend are expected to begin in 2025 when the aircraft is expected to enter into service. Since the inception of the more than 40-year relationship between the companies, NetJets has taken delivery of more than 800 aircraft from Textron, including exercising over 300 options for Citation Latitudes and Longitudes during the past eight years. Preliminary performance targets for the Citation Ascend indicated that it will have a four-passenger range of 1,900 nautical miles at high-speed cruise power, with an estimated maximum range of 2,100 nautical miles. It'll cruise at 441 knots and have the ability to climb to flight level 450. The aircraft will offer Pratt & Whitney Canada PW545D engines and the Garmin G5000 avionics suite, including autothrottle technology. The anticipated ascent design for NetJets will feature a standard seating configuration for seven passengers. From avweb.com, Cirrus has an option to sell a new Rotax-powered trainer. With the training market still booming, Cirrus has in the wings a new trainer model, the SR-10, slightly smaller than the entry-level SR-20. The airplane has three seats and is powered by the Rotax 915 IS, according to the type certificate approved by the FAA in April of this year. The SR-10 was developed jointly in the U.S. and China by Cirrus under contract with its parent, the Chinese-owned Aviation Industry Corporation of China, or AVIC. It's identical to the AG-100 now undergoing certification in China after its first flight in 2020. Sir says AVIC has orders for the AG-100, but it's not known how many. According to the U.S. type certificate, it's certificated in the U.S. as a day VFR aircraft only. Max gross weight is 2,150 pounds on a wingspan of just over 35 feet, as compared to 38 feet and 4 inches for the SR-20. At 3,050 pounds, the SR-20 is 900 pounds heavier. The SR-10 has two front seats and a single center-mounted rear seat and has a Cirrus ballistic parachute system and Garmin avionics. Ivy McIver, Cirrus director for the SR Alliance, said Cirrus retains the option to sell the SR-10 in the U.S., 
but doesn't have the airplane on the product roadmap. Cirrus already has its own track line of trainers based on the SR-20 and SR-22. Further, McIver said the company has no production capability to build an additional model. From avgeekery.com, NTSB says pilot posting to social media caused fatal crash. The NTSB has released a final report on the fatal 2021 crash of a 1966 Cessna 182H in St. Louis, Michigan. They found that the likely cause was due to the pilot posting to social media 35 seconds before the deadly accident occurred. The 23-year-old pilot was the only soul on board and was posting to Snapchat during a low-level pipeline patrol just before he hit a radio tower guy wire. The plane's left wing was sheared off, sending the Cessna into the ground three-tenths of a mile away. It then burst into flames. The report said, quote, Based on the known information, it is likely the pilot was distracted while he used his mobile device. In the minutes before the accident, he did not maintain an adequate visual lookout to ensure a safe flight path to avoid the radio tower and its guy wires. Contributing to the accident was the pilot's unnecessary use of his mobile device during the flight, which diminished his attention slash monitoring of the airplane's flight path. About 15 seconds before the accident, the airplane was about two-thirds of a mile southeast of the tower in a shallow right turn when it entered a climb from 475 feet AGL. At the final radar return, about 600 feet east-southeast of the tower, the airplane's altitude, calibrated airspeed, and climb rate were about 1,370 feet MSL, 104 knots, and 1,575 feet per minute. That's pretty high climb rate. The airplane's final altitude was 370 feet below the top of the radio tower, and its ground track was toward the guy wires located on the northeast side of the radio tower. Based on the airplane's ground track and rapidly increasing climb rate, the pilot was likely trying to avoid the tower guy wires during the final moments of the flight. From OneMileAtATime.com, Kalita Air 747 tries to take off without a clearance. On August 11th, 2023, Kalita Air Flight 690 from Cincinnati to Anchorage was being operated with a 31-year-old Boeing 747-400. The jumbo jet was instructed to line up and wait on runway 27, and one of the pilots of the plane correctly read back the instructions. However, for whatever reason, the pilots shortly began their takeoff roll down the runway. At the same time, an Endeavour CRJ-900, operating on behalf of Delta Connection, arriving from Minneapolis, was cleared to land on the intersecting runway and touched down. Fortunately, the controller quickly caught the mistake and advised the Kalita Air pilots to cancel their takeoff clearance before they reached the runway intersection. And of course, it was only a few weeks ago that we were talking about a similar near-miss that occurred under similar circumstances in Boston. From newsforjax.com, pilot air blamed in crash at St. Augustine Airport that killed two. Two years ago, after a fatal plane crash that killed two people at Northeast Florida Regional Airport near St. Augustine, the final NTSB report reveals what went wrong. The crash killed a CFI and a student pilot prospect. The purpose of the local flight was to provide a discovery flight experience for a prospective student pilot. A witness reported that they saw the airplane flying about 100 feet above ground level with, quote, the wings swaying up and down during its approach to land. The nose of the airplane was pitched upward, but suddenly the airplane pitched down before it impacted the runway, consistent with an aerodynamic stall. A post-impact fire ensued. Probable cause, the flight instructor's exceedance of the airplane's critical angle of attack, which resulted in an aerodynamic stall during the landing approach. From GeneralAviationNews.com, pilot mistakenly extends flaps instead of landing gear. The pilot and flight instructor were conducting a flight review in the Beach M35. On the downwind leg of the traffic pattern at the airport in Osage Beach, Missouri, the pilot reduced the throttle to idle to simulate an engine failure, but then inadvertently extended the flaps instead of the landing gear. While on short final, he increased engine power to ensure that the airplane reached the runway, and as such, the landing gear horn did not sound. However, when engine power was subsequently reduced to idle before touchdown, the pilot then heard the landing gear horn. The airplane landed on the runway with the landing gear retracted. The airplane came to rest on the runway and sustained substantial damage to the engine keel beam. Probable cause, the pilot and flight instructor's failure to ensure that the landing gear was extended prior to landing. And in other headlines, a 64-year-old Ottawa, Canada man is facing charges after a plane stolen at the Rockcliffe Airport crashed and struck two airplanes. Police say a man gained access to the airport and stole a privately owned Cessna. They said he, quote, 
attempted to fly the plane from the airport, but gained minimal air and then crashed, striking two parked planes. And two pilots were killed in a mid-air collision during the National Championship Air Races in Reno this past Sunday. The Reno Air Racing Association said the two planes collided as they were landing at around 2.15 p.m. FAA said that one pilot was flying a single-engine North American T-6G, and the other was flying a single-engine North American AT-6B. Pilots were identified as Nick Macy and Chris Rushing. This is the final year that the National Championship Air Races will be held in Reno. And Eugene Buzzy Peltola Jr., the husband of a member of the Alaska House of Representatives, died in a fatal plane crash last week in Alaska. He was the sole person aboard a Piper Super Cub that crashed shortly after takeoff in a remote area of Alaska. A 2021 investigation from ProPublica and Unalaska Public Radio Station KUCB found that since 2016, 42% of U.S. deaths from small aircraft crashes occurred in Alaska up from 26% in the early 2000s. And that really surprises me that nearly half of all small aircraft deaths have been in just that one state. And a fatal ag aircraft crash in northern Grand Forks County, North Dakota last week was the ninth crop dusting fatality in the U.S. this year. Single-engine thrush S2R T660 crashed after striking a power line. The manager of a crop dusting service said, quote, in certain times of the day, wires can be hard to see. Misjudging when to pull up or pilots trying to go underneath the lines, that seems to happen the most. Just because you can go under power lines at one part of the field doesn't necessarily mean that you'll fit underneath them at the other end. And finally, in our headlines, dozens of aircraft in numerous buildings were damaged or destroyed when a windstorm hit Falcon Field, that's KFFZ, in Mesa, Arizona last week. Local officials said the storm was a microburst. Aircraft went airborne and collided with other aircraft in buildings. Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up next, a few of my updates. And then we'll talk about how the crew and ATC dealt with the emergency of Endeavor Flight 1516. And we'll hear the interview from Plane Crazy Down Under about Frequentus Remote Towers. All right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And now let's get to the good news. First, congratulations to my client, Todd Hesse, who passed his private. He did that in a Cirrus SR-20. Congratulations, Todd. Great work. You've really come a long way, and you're a super pilot now. And here's a note from Robert Emery. He says, my wife, Katrina, is also a supporter. She just passed her ATP and type readings in the ERJ-170 and the ERJ-190. All that while raising our two-and-a-half-year-old son and four-year-old daughter, on top of those accomplishments, she taught me everything I know about aviation. I am actively working on my IFR in our Saratoga P32RT. We love your show. Keep up the great work. Robert and Katrina Emery. Well, thanks so much and congratulations to you, Katrina. And I was on the phone earlier today with marketing manager for Lightspeed, who I've known for many years. And she told me that now is the time to get your Lightspeed Delta Zulu if you've been thinking about that. They had a price increase a couple of months ago. However, they are having a very short-term promotion last less than three weeks in which you can buy the Delta Zulu at the old price. So it's $100 off, available at $10.99 versus the $11.99, which is the new price that they set a few months ago. Now, if you've forgotten, that headset is the first to market the carbon monoxide alert system and probably one of the big benefits for those of us who have got some hearing loss it's the only headset out there, to my knowledge, that allows you to adjust for the hearing loss at different frequencies so you can hear ATC audio better. And of course, as you know, Lightspeed supports this show every time you buy it, Lightspeed Delta Zulu, if you go first to one of our links that's in our show notes, or you can find those links at aviationnewstalk.com. So make sure you click on that link first before you order your headset. Now, I think I heard that the uh, promotion ends October 9th. I can't swear to it, but it was somewhere in that time frame. So get your order in now. And I mentioned last week on the show that I had a trip to Washington State. I recorded part of that show in the hotel room. That trip went very well. We logged uh, just about nine hours flying from Napa, California, up to Boeing Field and back. Spent two nights in the town of Kirkland. Now that's a name anyone who's ever shopped at Costco will recognize. That's where their headquarters is located. And it's also brand name they use for a lot of their products. Now, something funny happened. When I got back, I got a text message from mega supporter Marlon Dutra, who's supported the show for many years. 
He wrote, Hey Max, I was just listening to your latest show. Was that you in November 135 Delta Alpha last Wednesday following me into Boeing Field? <laughs> and I wrote back, OMG, that's so funny. Yes, I remember the call sign ended in something like Delta Delta. Initially, I was concerned that we'd be catching the airplane in front of us, but then I noticed that our speeds were virtually matched. What a funny coincidence. And he said, I was paying attention to you guys since we both got that big reroute west of Portland that I saw you landing and taxiing. And Marlon has a DA-62, which was delivered earlier this year. We were following him in a DA-42, which is why we were at very similar speeds as we went into the airport. Now, earlier today, I did a demo flight in a new aircraft type that's recently been certificated here in the U.S., and that will probably be our main topic for next week's episode. I also shot a lot of video, and if that came out okay, <laughs> of course, it doesn't always, but most of the time it does, I'll be posting that video for you if you've signed up to support the show via Patreon at the $20 a month level. So if sometime in the past you've thought, yeah, I do want to support the show, but you just haven't gotten around to it, well, if you do find time to do it later today, then I'll be reading your name on the show next week, and you could be watching those videos as well. And here are the names of the people who did choose to support the show last week. First, thanks so much to Robert and Katrina Emery, who added their pledge up to $50 a month, making them mega supporters. Thank you so much. Also, thanks to new supporters Coach Crash Latalian, Robert Holmes, and Scott Thompson. And we also had a one-time donation via PayPal from Barry Harper. So if you'd like to support the show, go ahead, pull the car over right now so you don't forget to do it. And then go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, where you can sign up to make a monthly donation via Patreon. Or go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal if you'd like to make a one-time donation via PayPal. And of course, when you do, I'll read your name on the show. And thanks so much to everyone who supports the show in whatever way you do. Coming up next, we'll talk about the emergency experience by Endeavor Flight 1516, and later we'll play the interview that appeared on Plane Crazy Down Under about Frequentis, which makes remote towers. All right here on the Aviation News Talk Podcast. Well, let's talk today about all the things that went right between a crew and ATC when a CRJ-900 operated by Endeavor declared an emergency. You may recall that earlier this year in episode 261, we talked about a fatal bonanza crash at Westchester County in New York, in which both the pilot and the controller probably could have done a better job of managing a slowly failing engine emergency. The pilot was very slow to declare an emergency and didn't head straight to the airport, and the controller descended the airplane even though the airplane had engine trouble. Sadly, the plane crashed short of the airport. So I'd like to contrast that event with this one, in which all parties involved did an excellent job of managing an emergency. According to avherald.com, this occurred on September 10th when the flight Endeavor 5316 from New York LaGuardia to Savannah, Georgia, was climbing out of LaGuardia's runway 13. The crew stopped the climb at about 12,000 feet and reported smoke in the cockpit. The aircraft diverted to New York's JFK airport for a safe landing on runway 22 left about 30 minutes after departure. A replacement CRJ-900 reached Savannah with a delay of about almost six hours. Now, I first heard the audio from this event on the Air Traffic Out of Control podcast, and I'll talk more about that podcast on a future episode. Here's the audio from LiveATC.com, starting when Flight 5316 checks in with New York approach shortly after takeoff. As you listen to it, Listen for things that went well, and also for any areas where you feel things could have been done a little bit better. After the audio, I'll tell you what I heard, so we can compare notes on what we heard. Correction, right, never uh, 5316, stand up uh, 1,100, climb aside. Never 5316, the flight's radar, contact, climb and maintain 1, 2,000. Climb maintain 16,000, never uh, 5316. Never 5316, now the rebadge is correct, it's 1, 2, 12,000. 12,000, Endeavor 5316. Endeavor 5316, turn left heading 340. Left turn 340, Endeavor 5316. Endeavor 5316, turn left heading 210. Left turn 210, Endeavor 5316. Endeavor 5316, don't exceed 25, they're not. Hi, don't exceed 259, Endeavor 5316. 
Hey, LaGuardia, uh, Endeavor uh, 5316, declaring emergency with smoke in the cockpit. Endeavor 5316, what's your uh, intentions? Uh, stand by, Endeavor 5316. Endeavor 5316, say intentions and uh, fuel and fills when you get a chance. No rush. All right, we've got 12.7 uh, uh, fuel on board and 75 passengers. That's 5316. Looking at a possible return to LaGuardia, we're just checking on the, the landing weight. Endeavor 5316, expect LaGuardia. You'd like to be sent now? Uh, yeah, let's do that. We'd like to get out of the clouds if possible. Endeavor 5316. Endeavor 5316, descend and maintain 6,000. All right, descend and maintain 6,000, Endeavor 5316. Endeavor 5316, are you guys on oxygen? Uh, negative. We just had a, a couple of sparks come out of our uh, windshield here. Uh, the smoke has stopped now, but we're probably going to have to come back to land at Endeavor 5316. Endeavor 5316, turn left, heading 020. All right, uh, left turn, uh, what was the heading, Endeavor 5316? Endeavor 5316, turn left, 020. Left turn, 020, Endeavor 5316. Endeavor 5316, Echo Stroke Current, LaGuardia, Atlas 22, uh, winds are 0605. All right, copy all. We'd just like to uh, get the lay vectors for right now as we're running the numbers, Endeavor 5316. Endeavor 5316, Roger. Flying 020 still. Riding 020, Endeavor 5316. Endeavor 5316, you ready going? Oh, we're communicating with dispatch right now. Just stand by, Endeavor 5316. Endeavor 5316, 250 knots, 50 knots. All right, 250 knots, Endeavor 5316. Endeavor 5316, turn right 100. 100, Endeavor 5316. Endeavor 5316, descend maintain 5,000. Maintain 5,000, Endeavor 5316. Endeavor 5316, any word? Uh, right now, we're still talking with dispatch. How's the weather in uh, JFK right now? Uh, JFK says two clouds, 3,000, uh, visibility 10. That's it, really. 10205, I look to left and right. Okay, so the uh, weather looks pretty good in JFK? Yeah, a lot better than the wording. Okay, stand by. We're talking to you. Thanks about JFK. It's not Endeavor 5316. Right, check. Endeavor 5316, turn right 140. Right, turn 140, Endeavor 5316. Endeavor 5316, anywhere step on. So you've got the heading, but you still not sure whether you want to go to Kennedy yet? Yeah, we're talking to dispatch. We're, we're deciding between Kennedy and LaGuardia right now. We'll have an answer for you soon, Endeavor 5316. Endeavor 5316, turn right 180. All right, left turn uh, 180, Endeavor 5316. Is it right turn? Endeavor 5316, turn right 180. Right turn 180, thanks, Endeavor 5316. We'd like to go to JFK, Endeavor 5316. Which, which runways are they using? 22 left and right, Endeavor 5316, fly heading 220. All right, 220 on the heading. Which runway can we expect, Endeavor 5316? Stand by. Endeavor 5316, expect 22 left. 22 left, Endeavor 5316. Endeavor 5316, contact approach 1257257, ILS 22 left. All right, ILS 22 left, uh, 25, 7, Deborah 5316. Good luck. Deborah 5316, did you make it over? We are, Deborah 5316. Uh, Deborah 5316, plotting 250, when able, direct Rosley for the ILS 22 left. All right, 250 on the heading and direct to Rosley, when able, never uh, 5316. Uh, Endeavor 5316, just to maintain 4,000, driving 12 o'clock, two miles westbound, a heavy out of three, is they're moving out of the way. All right, down to 4,000, copy on Endeavor 5316. Endeavor 5316, just to maintain 2,000. Down to 2,000, Endeavor 5316. Endeavor 5316, it appears you direct Zappo, sir, is that uh, where you're headed? We're direct to uh, uh, Roslyn, Endeavor 5316. All right, so yeah, with that heading, looks like uh, you're going to miss Rosley. Uh, well, you're turning now. That's good. Deborah 5316, cross Rosley at about 2,000, clear to Island, runway 22 left. All right, uh, can you just give us one more spin before we come in? We just need to finish up putting these numbers in at Deborah 5316. Deborah 5316, you got it. Uh, cancel approach clearance, turn left at in 190, maintain 3,000 feet. All right, maintain 3,000 feet, and uh, left turn to, you said 190, Deborah 5316? Deborah 5316, turn left to in 190. Left turn 190, thanks, Deborah uh, 5316. Deborah 5316, uh, contact New York approach 132.4. All right, 
132.4, Dover 5316. Approach Dover 5316, checking in 3000. Dover 5316, make approach, fly heading 170. All right, heading 170, Dover 5316. And Dover 5316, just advising, ready to go in for the approach. And runway 2 to red is available if you prefer that one also. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we just got to put plug in the numbers here and then we'll be ready. Stand by, Dover 5316. Roger. Endeavor 5316, heading 150. Heading 150, Endeavor 5316. Endeavor 5316, turn left, heading 010. All right, left turn 010, Endeavor 5316. Endeavor 5316, turn right, heading 050. Left turn 050, Endeavor 5316, we're ready right. approach. All right, I'm sorry, you said you're ready to go in for the approach? We are ready, Endeavor 5316. Okay, continue on, your, on this heading then, Endeavor 5316, and reduce speed to 200. All right, slow down 200, continue on this heading, Endeavor 5316. And Endeavor 5316, verify you do want runway 22 left, not 22 right, correct? We're fine with 22 left right now. The uh, numbers are showing us with uh, plenty of runway on 22 left, Endeavor 5316. Roger, Endeavor 5316, turn left heading 340. All right, left turn 340, Endeavor 5316. Endeavor 5316, turn left heading 310. All right, left turn 310, Endeavor 5316. Endeavor 5316, 1 1 miles from Zalpo, turn left heading 250, maintain 3000 till established, but I was from my 22 left approach. All right, now left turn 250, maintain 3000 until established, clear ILS, 22 left approach, Endeavor 5316. Approach Endeavor 5316, we'd like to have uh, our uh, follow us to the gate uh, to cross Endeavor 5316. Roger, just, we'll set that up at the tower. Endeavor 5316, contact Kennedy Tower, 11 on our point one. 1913, help Endeavor 5316. Endeavor 5316, inbound, ILS 22 left. 5316, Kennedy ground, run, Carson Kennedy Tower, runway 22 left, Fort Worth, Terminal 5330, touching down, wind 050 at fire, clear land. Clear land, 22 left, Endeavor 5316. Juliet. Right, Juliet, Endeavor 5316. 5316 as you're able, Juliet short of runway 22 right. Juliet short of 22 right, below drive, Endeavor 5316. Now, the first thing I noticed was an incorrect read back by the crew. Endeavor 5316, the departure radar contact, climb and maintain 12,000. Climb and maintain 16,000, Endeavor 5316. Now, these kinds of things happen all the time, and in this case, things work the way they were supposed to, and the controller caught the air. And I mention this because there have been a number of occasions when I've been flying when I've heard an incorrect readback and the controller didn't catch it. Now, most likely that's caused by expectation bias in which the controller expects to hear the pilot read the instruction back correctly, as pilots do most of the time. And because they expect to hear it read back correctly, they sometimes don't notice when it's read back incorrectly. Now, when I fly off in a pilot and I will disagree over exactly what we heard. And in those cases, we usually push the playback button if there's time, or ask the controller to confirm the instruction. Soon after this transmission, the pilot declares an emergency. And LaGuardia uh, Endeavor uh, 5316 declaring emergency with smoke in the cockpit. So in sharp contrast with the Bonanza crash, this pilot declared an emergency at the first sign of trouble, unlike the Bonanza pilot who didn't declare an emergency for quite some time, even though he knew he had a problem. In addition to declaring an emergency, this pilot stated what the emergency was on the very first transmission. Soon after, the controller had this question for the crew. Never 5316, saying tensions and uh, fuel and flows when you get chance. No rush. All right, we've got 12.7 uh, fuel on board and 75 passengers. It's important to know the pilot's attention so that ATC can start working on plans to help them with their intentions. Notice the controller said no rush. In this particular case, that's probably appropriate. However, the controller in the Bonanza crash said exactly the same thing, and that was at a point in time when the pilot was continuing to fly away from the airport even though he knew they had engine trouble. In that case, no rush might not have been as appropriate given that the pilot really did need to turn back to the airport immediately. By contrast, this crew had two engines that were still operating, so indeed there probably was no need to rush. There are 56 expect the board. you like to decent that now? Uh... Yeah, let's do that. We'd like to get out of the clouds if possible. Endeavor 5316. Endeavor 5316, descend and maintain 6,000. Notice that in this case, ATC asked the pilot, would you like to descend now? Now, that's in sharp contrast to the Bonanza event in which the controller told the pilot to descend without asking him if he wanted to. Now, the Bonanza pilot also missed an opportunity when he was instructed to descend. It would have helped if he'd said something like, no, please keep me up as high as possible, as long as possible, until I get within gliding range of the airport. Now, in this case, ATC asked if the pilot would like lower. 
The pilot thought about it, accepted the lower altitude, and even gave his rationale for accepting the lower altitude, which was that he wanted to get out of the clouds. Now, that was a reasonable decision by the pilot, as he had two engines and there was no sign of trouble with either engine. Plus, things are always simpler when you're not in the clouds, so why not descend and remove one minor risk element, which was that you might possibly lose control if you're in the clouds. Never 316, are you guys on oxygen? Uh, negative. We just had a, a couple of sparks come out of our uh, windshield here. Uh, the smoke has stopped now, but we're probably going to have to come back to land there for 5316. Now, that was a great question by the controller. Are you guys on oxygen? Controllers have emergency checklists that they pull out to remind them to ask questions like that. And frankly, it's a great reminder to pilots that maybe they should be on oxygen if they haven't gotten on it. Also, in this particular case, it helped the controller get a better understanding of the situation. And it worked. The controller learned that the smoke had stopped and that the crew most likely was going to be coming back to land. Never 5316, turn left, heading 020. All right, uh, left turn, uh, what was the heading, Endeavor 5316? Endeavor 5316, turn on 020. Left turn 020, Endeavor 5316. Pilots are always under additional stress, no matter how minor the emergency. So it's easy to miss an instruction. This pilot did the right thing. He asked to verify the heading. Endeavor 5316, echo stroke current, LaGuardia Island 22, uh, winds are 0605. All right, copy all. We'd just like to uh, get the lay vectors for right now as we're running the numbers. The controller is being very helpful. He volunteered the ATIS information for LaGuardia so the crew didn't have to look it up. Makes total sense. They're busy right now talking to dispatch, trying to figure out exactly what they're going to be doing. They don't have as much time as most crews would have to be listening to the ATIS. And the pilot knows that he needs more time. He did the right thing and he asked for delay vectors. This will give him all the time he needs to finish talking with the dispatch, to run all the numbers on their landing weight, and to figure everything else out. Never 5316, any word? Uh, right now we're still talking with dispatch. How's the weather in uh, JFK right now? Uh, JFK says two clouds, 3,000, uh, visibility 10. I say really, wind 0205, I look left and right. Okay, so it's, uh, weather looks pretty good in JFK? Yeah, a lot better than the wording. Now, the pilot is doing a couple of things right here. He's talking with dispatch to figure out whether LaGuardia or JFK is their best option, probably based on things like runway length and whether they have maintenance staff at the airport that can help and probably lots of other factors too. And the pilot just got ATC to help him out by asking about the weather at JFK. Now, the approach controllers I've seen when I visited NorCal Approach have a big screen in front of them with the current weather for a dozen or more airports. It literally takes them two seconds to glance up and read the weather for any airport. Contrast that with all the steps it takes a pilot to find the weather for alternate airports that he or she is considering, and it makes a lot of sense to ask for help. ATC gives the weather for JFK, and the pilot immediately checks for understanding. Okay, so the weather looks pretty good in JFK. Now there's a lot going on in the cockpit. The pilot may not remember exactly what the weather is currently at LaGuardia, he thinks the weather the controller just gave him for JFK sounds better than what he remembers for LaGuardia, but he's checking with the controller to verify that. Again, it's easy for the controller to compare the weather at two airports when they're both up on the screen in front of him. Later, ATC gives this instruction. Never 53, 16, right, 180. All right, left turn, uh, 180, under 53, 16. Is it right turn? Never 5316, turn right 180. Right turn 180, thanks. Again, there's a lot going on in the cockpit in any emergency, and it's sometimes hard to remember what you heard even as little as five seconds later. The aircraft was on a 140 heading. The new heading is 180, so as the pilot is reading back, he's probably thinking, a left turn doesn't sound right as that's the long way around to turn to 180. So as he's done before, he checks, is that a right turn? And the controller confirms it's a right turn. Now, the pilots have finally decided to land at JFK, and it's going to take a while for them to set up their FMS systems, and they want to get ahead of the game, so they want to know now what runway they could expect, rather than waiting to find out later. We'd like to go to JFK and Endeavor 5316. Which, which runways are they using? 22 left and right, Endeavor 5316, fly heading 220. All right, 220 on the heading. Which runway can we expect, Endeavor 5316? Stand by. Endeavor 5316, expect 22 left. Two, two left, never fixed, three, six, eight. Later, they're switched to another approach controller, and the controllers, to the credit, are watching over them very carefully, as you can hear from this exchange. 
5316, plotting 250, when able, direct Rosley for the ILS 22 left. All right, 250 on the heading and direct to Rosley, when able, never uh, 50, uh, 316. And then after a traffic call and two descents all the way down to 2000, we hear this. Never 5316, it appears you direct Zappo, sir, is that uh, where you're headed? We're direct to uh, uh, Rosley, never 5316. All right, so yeah, with that heading, looks like uh, you're going to miss Rosley. Uh, no, you're turning now. That's good. Never 5316 cross Rosley at about 2,000. Cleared Island, runway 22 left. But the crew's still not ready, and that's fine. They do the right thing. All right, uh, can you just give us one more spin before we come in? We just need to finish up putting these numbers in. Never 5316. Never 5316, you got it. Uh, cancel approach clearance. Turn left at in 190. Maintain 3,000 feet. Then after a series of turns, we hear this exchange. Left turn 050, never 5316, we're ready to approach. All right, I'm sorry, you said you're ready to go in for the approach? We are ready, never 5316. Okay, continue on, your, on this heading, then, never 5316, and reduce speed to 200. All right, so then 200, continue on this heading, never 5316. And endeavor 5316, verify you do want runway 22 left, not 22 right, correct? We're fine with 22 left right now. The uh, numbers are showing us with uh, plenty of runway on 22 left, never 5316. Overall, this appears to me to be a textbook case by both the crew and ATC on how to handle an emergency. And hopefully you picked up something from this that will be helpful to you if you have an emergency. But remember, if you detect that you're having some issue, declare an emergency as soon as possible. That way ATC can help you as soon as possible. If instead you're more circumspect and just hint around that, yeah, there might be some minor issues, ATC may have to start playing 20 questions to try to extract information from you about what's going on. And if they don't have time to do that because they're dealing with other traffic, they might not offer any assistance until things get worse and you finally do get around to declaring an emergency. Remember, there is no penalty for declaring an emergency, so you shouldn't hesitate to declare one as soon as you realize that you're having issues in the cockpit. And now let's take a listen to an interview that was recorded by the Plain Crazy Down Under podcast. That would be Grant and Steve down in Australia, in which they interviewed Mark Robinson of Frequentis Austral Asia. Now, we talked briefly about Frequentis last week in episode 292, and you can learn more about what they do with remote towers in this interview. Here's the interview. But also that what's important, mate, is, uh, speaking of at a distance, is being able to set up air traffic control towers at remote locations, improve safety without having to have that uh, overhead of people on site. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a matter of, in one case, keeping people away, but in this case, keeping people closer to population <laughs> centres and still being able to, uh, you know, serve a very important uh, air traffic control function. Let's head back to Avalon and have a listen to Mark Robinson from Frequentis. Okay, Mark Robinson from Frequentis, welcome to the show. Thanks, Grant. Great to be here. Excellent. Now, mate, we're standing here in Avalon and at the Frequentis stand. So let's start a quick background of yourself and Frequentis, an overview of what the uh, organisation does. Sure. Um, so I'm English, obviously, by heritage. Um, I came to Australia 25 years ago. Just had my 25th anniversary, in fact. Wow. And the accent's still strong. I'm afraid so. <laughs> uh, I'm an air traffic controller by trade. Mm -hmm. um, I was in the Royal Navy in the UK for 10 years as a controller, controlling on aircraft carriers on a shore basis. And in 1990, I came to Australia and joined the Australian Air Force, and I did another 11 years in the Air Force as a controller, um, finishing up as a wing commander and leaving uh, in 2008. So I'm a controller by trade, still very much in that shapes a lot of the things that I do. I've been working in private industry now for about the last 15 years, and I've been with Frequentis for about seven. Um, and my current role is I'm the head of sales and head of air traffic management for Frequentis in Australasia. And by Australasia, I mean... Australia, New Zealand, uh, Fiji, Papua New Guinea, and some other Pacific Islands. So we have a fairly wide market. That's a very, very large chunk of the earth right yeah, there. Absolutely. Yeah. So can you uh, step us through Frequentis and also Frequentis Australasia? Sure. Um, so Frequentis is an Austrian headquartered company. We have about 3,000 people around the world. And the headquarters is based in Vienna. Uh, and we address essentially five business markets. By, by far, our biggest market is the uh, air traffic management world. And I'll talk more about that in a little while. But probably second to that is defense. Um, and in defense, we look at air traffic control and air defense. And then the, the three of the units that we look at is public transport, which is mostly railway systems, public safety, which tends to be the blue light organizations. So control rooms, for example, uh, such as the Metropolitan Police in London, 
And finally, maritime. Um, so that is things like coast guards, marine rescues, that sort of world. The, the key commonality between all those customers is the need for mission critical and safety critical equipment, whether that be information systems or in a lot of our cases, communications. They have to be highly redundant, highly dependable, um, often five and six nines are reliability. So we have to meet those. Uh, and that's what we do across those business segments. In Australia, we've had a presence here since about 2004. And we've grown from about four or five guys back then to about 130 people now. So we have uh, four offices, um, Brisbane, which is where the head office is, where I'm based, uh, Sydney, Melbourne, and a small office in Perth. Um, we're still growing, getting a lot of contracts, but um, going well so far. Fantastic. So now that we've got the overview, let's talk about what's taking everyone's eyes here at the stand is three very large screens and a control panel, obviously for a virtual air traffic control or remote air traffic control. Are you able to talk about that product? Sure. Um, so remote tower or digital tower or virtual tower, those terms are kind of interchangeable. They're used by different people, but they all mean pretty much the same thing. Uh, and what it's doing in very simple terms is replacing uh, the view that a normal controller has out of the window with cameras and taking that camera feed to be controlled somewhere else. The somewhere else can be downstairs on the same airfield in a port port uh, portable building, an ATCO hut, something like that. Or, as we do in Germany, it can be five or 600 kilometers away in a completely different city. And to be quite honestly, the, the technical challenges doing it 500 kilometers away or doing it downstairs on the airfield are the same. Okay. So it's been growing. It started in Scandinavia at some very um, slow moving airfields where they wanted to centralize the workforce. And it's very much grown from that. Uh, our first customers in Germany with the German ANSP DFS, who are quite a well known company. Um, and we now have two certified systems in Germany that the regulator has stamped and said that's all safe. So we are providing air traffic control day in, day out at those places. And the first one has been since about 2018. So it's five years of operations where it's all done by cameras and not work control time. That's fantastic. So this is real world application. It's not, oh, we're doing a prototype or a trial. Absolutely. It's in use. Absolutely. So we have, I think we have about five different systems certified around the world. Um, we have one in Jersey in the Channel Islands, which is used as a contingency application. And by that, I mean, if they have to evacuate the tower for a fire or a terrorist threat, they can turn the cameras on and use those rather than having to somehow get the picture again. So, yep. so that's in Jersey. We have one in uh, Brazil and Argentina certified as well. So we have quite a range uh, of actual in full operation. Yeah. And that's obviously equipped quite a few different countries and countries that have very different infrastructure environments as well. Absolutely. And the infrastructure is really important, um, especially when you think about the German case when you have to transport the video five or 600 kilometers away. You need to clearly have to have a very highly dependable network infrastructure in place, whether it be fiber, tends to be the preferred method of communication um, with a redundant path, of course, because as anyone who works in an airfield knows, there's always work going on and there's always a backhoe digging stuff up. So it's not unusual for things to get broken. So we have to have the diverse paths yep. to, to meet all the normal requirements for, for any aviation equipment. Yeah, exactly. So that's all your uh, DA-178, 278, all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Software assurance is the way we develop it. So all the same, we have to show the artifacts, mm -hmm. how we've done that, which yep. is an interesting point because a lot of people ask about artificial intelligence and how that may come into this. And it's got a place. Um, some of the problems with AI is it's very hard to follow that software assurance path, mm -hmm. how you've got to making yep. the decision. So that will come for sure. Um, I think we just need to introduce those things a little gradually. Yeah, it'll take like a common base AI module that has gone through the rigmarole of testing that you then build on yeah, the certification. So yeah. in Europe, South America, UK area, that kind of thing. How about here in Australia or in the Asia Pacific area? Are you getting many nibbles for this? So there is um, Air Services, the, the ANSP here, have been looking at digital towers for probably about 10 or 11 years now. Um, they did a trial between Alice Springs and Adelaide in around 2010, 11, which it was very early days for the technology. Yeah. So there was a number of reasons that didn't go on. So they've gone back to it. They've given it a little bit more time for the technology to mature. And they've gone to market over the last couple of years again for that. We were looking enough to be the preferred supplier for our services. And we are um, under contract now to provide that in two locations in Australia. And that project's just started. Uh, and that will be rolling out over the next two or three years. And hopefully that'll be the, the first two of a number of places. Our service is very open to say that there are 
several of their towers, which are getting quite old, yeah. which could be candidates to be replaced with this technology. So we'll see how that goes in the next few years. Plus, there's a number of locations that could really do with the tower, but getting people out to those locations, manning them, building Absolutely. it, all that is pain in the butt. Absolutely. And there are certain locations which we see the number of uh, movements increasing rapidly. Cool. And I know that Castle looks at these very carefully to make sure the operations are still safe. Uh, one of the things that may happen is that air services are asked to provide a service. So this may be, you know, this technology may be something which can help with that. Are you getting much uh, interest from defence for this, given that they have their own uh, areas, towers, all that kind of thing? They do. Um, one of the things we're looking at um, and talking to defence about is the deployable or the expeditionary aspect of this. We have some contracts with the uh, US Department of Defence for a couple of fixed and a couple of deployable versions for this. So that's a very good um, reference, if you like, that the, uh, the US military put their trust in is to do that. So um, we're having some ongoing discussions with the Air Force about uh, how this might work in a deployable situation. Um, it certainly would bring some benefits to them. Um, I spent some time in the Middle East in the early 2000s when the Air Force was providing uh, tower services in Baghdad. And I think if some of this technology had been around, then it might have might have been used if you know, to try and get the controllers out of harm's way, that would have been a good thing, I think. So. Yeah, so they're not so obvious being up the tower, especially some of the uh, temporary ones that are scissor lifts. Yeah. Pretty obvious there. Yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us while we're here? No, I think um, it's great to be back at Avalon. This is the first time we've been here for four years, obviously, because of COVID and a number of things. Uh, we've got our sister company, C4I, here, who are, as I mentioned before, a very um, important defence supplier. So, no, we're just delighted to be here and, uh, and see people and talk face to face. Fantastic. Thanks very much for coming on the show. Okay, pleasure. And thanks to Mark for his time there. Really interesting stuff, both from the civil and the defence side. And uh, Grant, Mark's actually a very, very interesting character in himself uh, when you consider the uh, rather extensive history that he's had. That's certainly the case, mate. And that history is being applied very well in his current role. So I'm looking forward to seeing technology like this allowing us to have improved safety at regional locations. There's a lot of airports around that could do with an air traffic control tower, but that it's just too expensive to establish and maintain and staff them. So this could be the opportunity we need. Well, the interesting thing there is, Grant, that you could still staff those towers but have those staff somewhere closer to a population centre where presumably most staff would want to be. Um, if people think back to our original series and our good friend ATC Ben, an air traffic controller, now he works locally here in Melbourne these days, but he actually did a stint way out in uh, Caratha, I think it was mm -hmm. actually. Yep, that's right. Now, I mean, I think um, I'm probably putting words in his mouth, but I think Ben actually enjoyed that experience. However, if you think about uh, Air Services Australia's ability to be able to recruit people to work in those locations or at least to work those locations, mm. you know, there's some real advantages here, I think, in, uh, in looking at this as a solution. Oh, it certainly is, mate. And we've already got the situation now where, speaking of ATC Ben, he's one of the controllers working Adelaide approach departure from Melbourne. So we're already doing it in a way. Yeah, that's that's very, very true. So uh, some really good uh, high-tech stuff there. It's always good to talk about advances in technology, and particularly this one where hopefully it wouldn't Im impact, you know, staffing, hopefully, uh, too badly. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty impressed with that. I always like a bit of technology, Grant. <laughs> technology that augments, not replaces entirely. And my thanks to Stephen Grant for letting me replay that interview. You can find their podcast, Plain Crazy Down Under, wherever you get podcasts, or check out plaincrazydownunder.com. And just a reminder that I love hearing from you, and I read many of your emails on the show. If you'd like to send me a message, just go out to aviationnewstalk.com, click on Contact at the top of the page. That's absolutely the best way to send me a message. And of course, I also want to thank everyone who supports the show in one of the following ways. We love it when you join the club and sign up at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome to support the show financially. You can also do that at aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. We also love it when you leave a five-star review on whatever app that you're listening to us on now. But most importantly, please tell one or more of your friends about the show. That's the primary way that we grow the show. So please let your friends know about Aviation News Talk. And of course, if you're in the market for a headset, please consider buying a Lightspeed headset and using one of the links in our show notes because if you use those links, they will donate to help support the show. So until next time, fly safely, have fun and keep the blue side up and remember that you can always go around. You can